that scares me every time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction about the SFSS. And then after that, Sahil can talk about the UPhoto Photography Club and we can get started. So hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer. I'm the VP Student Life of the SFSS. And basically, the SFSS represents all the undergraduate students at SFU. And we provide services like the UPASS, health and dental plan, um, fun events like this, fun events and workshops. So be sure to follow our events Instagram at SFSS underscore events on Instagram. Um, we're actually doing a giveaway right now um, where you can win a $50 Starbucks gift card if you like pumpkin spice or Starbucks or coffee. Um, yeah, so be sure to check us out. We also have our annual general meeting coming up this month on Monday, October 26th at 3.30 p.m. So please make note of that date and time because we will basically be shaming SFU for raising tuition during a pandemic. So if you want to vote to shame SFU, please come. Uh, more details will be on our social media, so follow SFSS like everywhere. <laughs> Um, okay, so here, do you want to go ahead and introduce you, Photo, and yourself? Yeah, okay, so my name is Sahil Singh. I am an environmental science student, and I'm also the executive for marketing of the U Photo Club. And the U Photo Club is basically like anyone, is it, anyone who's like interested in photography is welcome to join U Photo. You don't have to have like a physical camera, you can have your, you can use your phone or iPhone or Samsung or whatever you have. And it's just a way of getting everyone that's interested in photography to come together and create some amazing photos and just have fun and learn new skills from each other. So yeah, the Youth Photo Club, you can join it and I will get started. So let me just uh, share my screen. Are you able to see this? Okay, yeah, so can. yeah, but it's not okay, full screen. You. It's not full screen. I think you have to click present. On oh, it. yeah, I have to do present. Okay, you can see it now. Yeah, that's good. Okay, wait. Um, Is there a way of, uh, wait. Presentation. Okay. So basically, I'm going to basically like start off with all the basics of camera gear and how to operate your camera. And then I would go into more of like the rules of photography and what you would look out for when you're trying to create an image or something. And then um, after, uh, after that, you can, I'll explain more of like the skills involved where what you're supposed to look out for, like composition. And I want to kind of focus on, I, most of my explanations today are going to be based on landscapes. So it's not, it could, it's the same as photography for portraits, but portraits have like another kind of, I'm kind of more specialized in landscape photography is something I enjoy doing way more. So I'm just gonna more focus, explain more on like the landscape aspect compared to um, portraits, but portraits are obviously like the settings and everything are gonna be the same. So the camera setting for ISO is something every camera has and you can also every phone has also but some are limited I don't know if you can change ISO on some phones but the ISO is basically like the sensitivity of your camera it's the higher the number the more sensitive your light your camera is the sensor inside your camera and then lower the number the less is going to be like um, the more clear if you go to a lower ISO ISO 100 ISO 200 you're gonna have a more clear image. But if you're in a darker environment, you're going to need a higher ISO. But the problem with higher ISO is it's gonna introduce green. So if you're shooting something at 6,400, you're gonna have way more green in your image, but 
that's something you have to compensate for with a tripod or having your hands more still. So you want to keep your eyes so lowest as possible when you can, but there's obviously exceptions. And when you're not able to use a tripod or something, you need to have a handheld, handheld shots with your uh, pictures. And if you go with more expensive cameras, you can have a higher ISO. So I know that the like Sony a7 III, one of the newer cameras, not the newest, but it's a relatively new camera that can go up to ISO 12,000, 20,000. It can go way up there, but some of the older models have a limited ISO, which is maybe 64 is the most it can go up to. And then the next thing you have is aperture and it's like the size of the opening of your lens. So every camera lens is, this is not a part of your body. This is the actual lens of your camera. So this doesn't have anything to do with uh, what's on your camera. This is a separate portion. And it's basically, um, it's the, the intervals are like F, they're called f-stops. And the f-stops are usually um, pretty expensive if you want to get a low f-stop, like 1.4. And if you want one that goes like a wide range, those lenses cost way more money than compared to a fixed aperture. And a fixed lens aperture, like you can get a fixed lens aperture for, there's a variable, like there's a uh, wide variety of how many you can get. Fixed apertures, you can go f1.4 uh, and that's the only aperture they have. But then there's obviously other lenses you can get that have a wide variety and wide range. And the aperture is basically, there's blades inside your camera that once you turn higher, the higher the number, the closer the opening is, smaller the circle is. And what that does is basically makes the image more sharp and more, or no, not more sharp, but it makes the image, um, the whole entire image in focus compared to when you have a subject at 1.4 aperture. Here's an example. Here's my friend Charles. And we took uh, some portraits just in the park. And then, so this is shot at a 1.4 aperture meaning the, the background right yeah every the background is going to be um blurred out and then f18 you're going to have the whole image in focus and then another thing i want to add is if you look at the circles in the background of the image of the portrait image you can see these so these circly things that's called bokeh so there's different types of bokeh each lens is, each lens you buy has a uh, different unique bokeh type of style. You can get oval bokeh, you can get circular bokeh, and then the cinema lenses could also have like a wide different looking bokeh styles. And it always depends on the type of camera you or type of lens you have. And then you can also buy vintage lenses and they all have different types of like styles. And it really depends on the camera. Every camera is different. I mean, every lens is different. Um, so when you have shutter speed is the amount of time your shutter is open. So your shutter speed controls motion blur when taking pictures at fast moving objects. If you want a fast shutter speed, like 1 50th, then that will capture an image really quickly. It's how fast your shutter is opening in the camera. Um, every, even the older, like the vintage cameras, this is a uh, Olympus OM10, every, time you take a shot, it actually does um, the same thing with the shutter. So you can change the shutter to 60 or to 1000. It's how fast the opening inside your camera goes. So it's a little like it's a little like a uh, kind of like, um, uh, let's see, it's kind of like, yeah, like blinds or something when the blinds go down, it closes the opening. So you would want to have the shutter speed doesn't matter. It's not the same thing as ISO, meaning it doesn't reduce quality or anything. But if you want to capture something really quickly, you need to have a higher, ISO, uh, higher shutter speed. And then there's white balance. This is something in your camera that has setting of what the colors kind of look like. It's the camera function that informs the camera what lighting environment and conditions you're filming under in order to remove color cast from the image. So if you're shooting a, like a bright sunny day and compared to a cloudy day, you would have different kind of, usually on your camera, this set to auto and there's not much of an issue. 
the camera does a pretty good job of detecting what type of environment you're in. But you could change the um, you can change it custom to different uh, like um, to different settings. Like three thousand would give you a more blue type of temperature color. So this is in like temperature range. And then making sure that your whites are like rendered as white when you're on your editing your pictures, you want to make sure when you're taking the picture, the whites in the picture are actually white. And usually that's changed with the white balance. And then when you're shooting raw, you're able to change the color balance in Lightroom. So it's not much of an issue. You can change this in post later, but usually you want to get everything on your camera sorted beforehand. So you don't have to do as much fiddling around in post later on. Wait, now this, um, yeah. So I know you specialize in landscape photography, but what if you're like taking pictures and it has to be quick and you don't have time to adjust all of these white balance settings? Yeah, like I said, um, you can usually put it in auto. Like usually your white balance is set to auto and I don't want to go like, it's not, it's not much of a problem actually. It's usually your camera and the newer cameras nowadays, they basically do like, a, they, they, they do like almost the exact setting you need for white balance. So it's not much of an issue. Usually like as technology is advancing, even autofocus when you're doing a shot, you know, when you shoot auto and manual, um, manual focus is you kind of have to get the focus yourself by changing, turning the ring. Now cameras are getting so fast at and so advanced at doing autofocus, people, a lot of photographers end up just leaving it on autofocus because they want to take shots really quickly and the camera computer does a really good job and then it shoots and does a really good job of actually capturing the thing and focus that you want. But if you're trying to do something more unique, if you want to say this picture, you want to get the, for some reason, if you're trying to get a different aesthetic look and you want to make the tree out of focus, then um, you would probably have to shoot that in a manual focus ring compared to auto because it would try to make the tree in focus. Uh, yeah. So now I'm going to go on to the rules of photography. And I want to, before I, I want to emphasize that these are not rules. These rules are like made to be broken. So it's kind of like guidelines. You learn in the basics of photography, you kind of learn these throughout in the beginning. But once you're done learning these, there's exceptions where you don't have to exactly follow these rules anymore. They're meant to be broken and you just try, you have to get uh, unique with your pictures and try to be different and not just have everything focused on the same rules all the time. So the take, composition, yeah. Did you take this photo too? Oh yeah, did I say that um, no, you didn't. everything, uh, I didn't say it. I wanted to say that um, all the pictures used in this presentation I've took taken like none of them are from the online website or anywhere online like these uh, pictures are from me except this one this is the only one I wanted to show because I had no example for this but this is the only thing I used uh, on from the website online the rest is made from me I took all these pictures so yeah I just wanted to say that um, so this is one of the basic rules is rule of thirds. So rule of thirds is when you frame the object or subject and the intersection point. So you have a grid like this and you usually wanna put the object or subject or whatever you're shooting, you wanna put the point of interest into one of these intersection points where the, um, like the Y axis is the X axis is, like the intersection where they have a little X and the those portions, the four portions is where you want to try to place your subject. And that's supposed to make the image look more interesting compared to just having the image always in the directly in the center. You usually things in nature are not um, they're always not perfect. So you want maybe just want to try to put it to the side just to make it look a little bit more interesting. And it's more like pleasing and dynamic to the human eye. And then there's um, center composition, where this is basically sometimes you do want to put the subject in the direct center. So you want to put the, I took this picture at um, the seawall, and then I wanted to have the this heron's head right at the center of the image. So when you look at this image, you look straight at the center. 
but this is not something you always have to do. You could, you could have, I could have shot this picture using rule of thirds, having it in one of the corners, but I decided to have it straight in the center this time. So did you decide to put it in the center while you were there taking the picture or did you crop it that way after? Um, this one I took, it was, in the center, but it wasn't exactly in the center because once you're out there shooting pictures, it's hard to get the picture uh, subject right in the dead center. So this is something you can do in post where you take a shot and it's okay if your subject's not in the exact center, you could change this later by cropping, like you said. So you can just put this in the exact dead center and then you can um, in Lightroom or on Photoshop, it's pretty easy. It gives you grid lines and you can place the image wherever you're, or you can place the subject wherever you want, wherever you feel. And if you have a high enough quality, you could also make this a rule of thirds. I could crop this even more and make this a rule of third shots if, if I wanted to. But uh, I decided, I don't know, first, I just decided to put it in the center for this one. Yeah. Uh, so this one, this shot on the right was at Steveston. And then the other shot on the left is in New York, um, the memorial for the 9-11 attack that happened, terrorism attack. And this is the escalator going up in the museum. So uh, the next one is leading lines. Um, so leading lines is basically, it's uh, something where you try to direct the viewer of the image towards the subject. So when I was taking this shot, I was looking at the log and the log has kind of lines going towards my friend standing over here in the field. So you follow the log and then you look towards the subject. And then the same thing with the escalator shot, it's kind of going up to that bright orange light. So it's going towards something. So leading lines, to, uh, leading lines basically shows you a direction of where you're supposed to be looking at when you're taking an image. So it like directs your viewer to where you're supposed to look at. And then this is something that is a little bit harder to find, but it's not too hard. If you're, if you're, if you know what you're looking for, then you can find type of it. There's this, this could come in like a different, a lot of different examples. Like it doesn't have to be just um, staircase or something. It could be anything, anything that kind of leads you to something. Oh, we have some comments in the chat. Um, first, some people are complimenting your pictures. They are amazing. Okay, um, I can't see the chat. <laughs> um, well, somebody said the picture on the right is amazing, but I think okay, all the pictures you. are amazing. Um, and then we have a question. Somebody is wondering, um, how do you decide when you will focus on the center or when you will use the rule of thirds? Um, that's kind of personal opinion, really. It doesn't matter too much you could always take a picture twice. You could always take a picture of the heron, for example, you could take it at a center shot and then you could take it at a rule third shot. And then later on, you can look at both of the images and decide for yourself, which one you think looks better. It kind of personal preference. Someone might think the center shot might look better compared to a rule of third shot. But I think the rule of third shot is kind of overused because that's basically the most basic type of rule that every, that's the basic rule everyone learns is called the rule of thirds. That's like the first thing when you go to a photography class or something, that's the first rule they teach because it's the most basic and most simple to understand. So it gives you kind of a way of looking at things differently, but that is also being used a lot from a lot of people. So it really depends on what you think yourself, what you want to do, what you want, what do you think looks better. And now I'm going to move on to foreground interest. And this is kind of, you have to, so when you're taking pictures in photography, we are restricted to two dimensions, right? We're not looking at a three dimensional image. Everything on the camera is going to be 2D. So when you're taking a picture, you want to try to create layering and try to create some depth into your image. So this is like the foreground interest, the far mountains. So this is the background. Then you're going to have your middle ground, which is this other mountain here with the trees. And then you're going to have your foreground, which is the flowers. So this is kind of separating it into layers to make it more, also making the image more dynamic and more interesting. And it's, um, yeah, so you're trying to restrict it. You're restricted to two dimensions. So 
you want to try to make it look more three-dimensional. It just makes it more interesting when you're taking pictures. And then this is not too something you do with portraits, really. It's kind of hard to do with portraits because you have your subject and usually the background's blurred and there's only the subject in the background for the portrait shots of like somebody, a subject. But this is more easy to, to do for landscape shots because you can find different layers in an image. So this is, yeah, this was a different layer. You want to try to go for more layers and the more layers might be better. So three layers is, uh, yeah, I think three layers would be, I think three, I don't know how would you, you could probably go more, depends on what you're shooting. And now I'm going to talk about um, the focal length and it's basically the, the, like um, the distance of where you're trying to focus. And then every focal length has a different perspective. And you can also have fixed focal lengths, like your camera could have a fixed focal length at 50 and you can't change that. But then you could also get a zoom lens, which goes to one, depends on the lens. You could go to 14 to 135 zoom lens. So that's where your subject is focused on. Um, this one was on a GoPro on the right side, the 14 millimeter. So this is a very wide shot and it's trying to show the whole image, the mountains, the trees and everything. And then the next one is 44 millimeter shot taken with my Fuji camera. And then I wanted to crop out this, um, some of this foreground elements here. I wanted to more focus on this, like the clouds and the mountains and the trees. So you can, depends on the situation. Um, yeah, it depends on the, it depends like on the framing of what you're shooting. Usually it's more simple. I think I would personally pick the 44 millimeter over the 14 millimeter. I think the 14 has a little bit too much in it. The clouds don't look very nice either. I like to have it more simple. We just have a blue sky and then have the clouds look more interesting. So it's more, more um, simple, but you could also go more dynamic. And then the next thing in photography is you want to basically place a, a person, a human being inside your pictures. And this is something where it creates a um, perception of how large things are. So if you're taking a picture of these mountains here, and this is me standing at Wedge Mount. And you can see compared to me, you can get like a size uh, perspective of how large the mountains are compared to how small I am. And then same thing with, uh, this was in Mexico. This is the resort. And then you can see how large the resort is and you can see the perspective of how small the people are. So it kind of gives you like a, um, a view of how everything looks, a perspective of from, from how small everything is. And then humans like to see other humans. So when you take a picture of something, you usually look for other human beings in the picture. This is not like required, but it's just another little detail that people look for is, it's kind of a natural thing where when you take a picture, people like to see other human beings cause um, I don't know too much about it, but it's like kind of like a, like a psychological thing. And now the next one is the golden ratio. This one is more, um, this was at my grandma's house outside on the street. And I took this with a wide lens, but the golden ratio is basically like a spiral. And this one is a little bit more harder to find because it gets more complicated with, um, you can go into the math into it. It's kind of like the Fibonacci sequence where you see this first rectangle on the right side it gets split up into the equal proportions, like A plus B over two, I think the equation was, but every time you split it up, I'm not gonna go into the math, but every time you split it up, it's like uh, the same ratio size as every time you break up the square or the rectangle. So you can see in the right, the big giant square, and then it gets smaller and it goes into perfect portions. So this is found in nature, like, um, the Romans really like this with their architecture and paintings. They always use the golden ratio because it was just something appealing and the math all makes sense with perfect proportioning. So this one is supposed to be kind of the viewer looks at the right side at the flowers or the 
cherry blossoms in the top right corner. And then they kind of follow the spiral looking at the other flowers and then they focus at the other cherry blossom tree in the corner. So it's um, something where you try to look, it tries to drive the viewer to look at the whole image instead of just that one spot. Try to make your eyes move around the image. So then there's also long exposures and this is all to do with shutter speed. And long exposure is one of my favorite types of photos to shoot. And it's basically, they take a lot of time. It depends. You can take um, 30 second long exposures. You could take 10 hours. It depends how long, or it depends if you're shooting something like a, if you're shooting space for us, like um, astrophotography, if you're trying to take pictures of the stars or a um, comets flying by, you kind of set up your camera on a tripod. You leave the shutter open. So all the light is going in, but since it's pitch black, there's very minimal light going into the camera. So when there's a meteor shower or comets, there's only a few, like they're only in the image for a few seconds. So if you leave it out, if you leave the shutter open for 10 hours, you get a really nice looking uh, meteor shower with all the lines on the image. So these ones are taken at nighttime. This one was at New York. And then the right one is in Vancouver downtown. And then these ones are about, I think, I don't know, 15 to 30 seconds. So what you want to do is you have your shutter open for a longer period of time and you let in more light for a longer period of time. And the more moving objects in the photo can add interest to the overall composition of the photo. All the moving objects will become blurry and all and everything that's moving will be everything in motion will become blurry. So if I'm taking a picture, so this one in New York, you can see the clouds are a bit blurry because the clouds are moving. But everything that's stationary is gonna stay in focus sharp image. Like these buildings are gonna be all in focus, very sharp because they're stationary, not moving. So when you're taking long exposures, you want to have a tripod set up. This is not something you can do with handheld. And you also want to set up a timer on your pic on your camera. So you want to have a two second timer because when you're taking a picture, um, you're pressing the shutter on the camera. And then this introduces a little bit of motion, like a little bit of shake to your camera. So when you have a timer on, you press the button, it goes timer for two seconds and you let it, you let it go. So there's no movement in the camera and this will cause um, no, yeah, no, no movement at all. So the picture would look very, sharp and there won't be any motion like moving from your tripod. So that's another thing you need. Um, and then it's not necessary, but it's helpful to have a tripod. You could also use sometimes when I don't have a tripod, I grab like some shoe or I grab like a rock or something, or like I have uh, grabbed like my jacket and you try to like place it on the ground or somewhere that you can have the image without moving the camera. So it's harder to take pictures without a tripod, but it's optimal to use a tripod. It's, way, it's just uh, more easy to have a tripod if you have one, if possible. Um, it, let's see. Yeah, so you also don't want to overexpose it. If you keep the shutter open for too long, these lights, like a lamppost or something, that have uh, that radiate a lot of light become overexposed. So this New York picture was very, I really like this shot, but some of the lights, like in the city down here, in the bottom kind of bright. There's a few buildings that were um, had brighter lights compared to the rest of them. So this became a little bit overexposed and it became a little bit too white, but you could change that in post. But then it's another thing that you have to change in post, which is usually you want to minimize the time in post because you want to have everything more efficient. So when you're taking pictures, make sure that the exposure length shutter speed is long enough, but not too long. Make sure it's like, it could be 15 seconds or it could be 30. You can try out 15 to see how the shot is, or you could try out 30 and just try different settings when you're taking the picture. Then there's something called uh, a neutral Wait, there is a yeah. question in the chat um, that some people talked about a little bit. Um, somebody asked, did you edit these nighttime photos with Lightroom after taking them or are these just directly from the camera? And then somebody else said, most likely you have to clean it up in Lightroom to remove noise or add sharpness. Yeah, um, these are both edited in Lightroom. Everything is, usually everything's edited in Lightroom. Like once you, when I take shots, I don't really, whatever the camera produces is not good enough. It's usually kind of a little bit of gray formatting. 
So you want to add more color into it. And this is usually something you do in Lightroom. And you can also add sharpness. But that causes, usually you want to have, like artificial sharpness sometimes doesn't look too good. You could add a minimal amount and it's it works usually. You can, you can add sharpness and it's something you don't want to overdo, but you can add a little bit of sharpness, maybe 20%. And that's something we can look at in the next workshop when we're doing the Lightroom and the Photoshop. But yeah, uh, is that, did I answer all the questions? Yeah, pretty much. Then there's neutral density filters. And this is basically doing long exposures during the day. And this is something where you have to have a neutral density filter. They're also called ND filters for short. And they're basically like sunglasses for your camera. So you have this black filter and they come in different price ranges. And obviously if you get a sh like a cheaper quality filter, they're not gonna do as good of a job. So when you have a neutral density filter, you, it's a basically like a piece of glass that you put on your, in front of your camera. Maybe I could, I don't, wait, yeah, right here. I can just show you the neutral density filter. So I got these ones, they're like, they're globe. And they're not too expensive. I got three of them for, I think they're, I think 80 or something. Don't remember the pricing too much, but they come in different, um, they come in different like uh, ND kind of size. So it's basically like a black filter. And then you put this on your camera and it basically reduces the amount of light you put into the camera. And that doesn't, it would not make too much sense of why would you want to reduce the amount of camera um, amount of light going into your camera, but that's a way of being creative in the daytime. So if you see the river here to the right, you take the shot on a fast shutter speed. This is what the image is going to look like with the water of exactly at that time you took it. So the so the, this is how the water is moving. But then if you put a neutral density filter on then the water, this is you basically doing like a 30 second, 20 second shutter open. So everything that's moving in the image, like clouds and water are going to be all smooth and kind of like silky kind of smooth look. And this happens with uh, basically the same way that a regular long exposure works. So it allows you to adjust your uh, shutter speed. And there's also fixed NDs, which are NDs that have like a certain they only have one uh, variable, like ND16 is four stops and then ND1000 is 10 stops. And that's kind of like uh, a way of determining how much light goes through. So if you go to 100 to 200 ISO, that's one stop. And then if you go to 200 to 400 ISO, that's another stop and it doubles each time. So if you go to 400, 800, that's another stop. So it keeps going up. So if you put the neutral density filter on your camera, it reduces the amount of stops going into your, into your camera, into your lens. And then uh, you can also get, so there's fixed ND filters and then there's also neutral density filters, which are two pieces of glass, which allow you to have all sorts of different stops. You can change the amount of light going in by having the two glass, the two glass components um, on top of each other and you can turn it where it basically changes the amount of light going through. But the variable ND filters have a little bit of, uh, um, they have like a, they kind of have an X pattern to it because there's a little bit of um, inconvenience with having, there's a loss of sharpness and vignetting uh, because there's two pieces of glasses with more moving parts. So it's usually better to have a fixed ND because the fixed ND has um, more sharpness and less vignetting and vignetting is basically the outside, there's um, like um, the outside borders of your image has like a, kind of a dark shade to it. So you want to usually reduce the amount of vignetting. It's called, <laughs> this entire time I thought it was pronounced vinaigrette. <laughs> vinaigrette? No. Vignetting. But you heard that before, right? Yeah, I just pronounced it weird. <laughs> I've never, that's the first time I heard someone call it vinaigrette. But yeah, um, I would recommend getting a fixed ND, even though that makes, that requires you to have more than one. So you're going to have to have 
a whole bunch of different NDs compared to just one, but it's basically the price you pay for is what you get. And that goes for a lot of things. So if you're going to pay for an expensive ND, then it's going to be far better. Um, so now I'm going to go over to aerial photography. And this is basically exactly the same as when you're taking pictures with your regular camera. This is just having your camera on like a uh, RC um, remotely piloted aircraft. And this is obviously shot on with using a drone. So all these shots I took facing down because I feel like I want to have the opportunity of getting shots that no one else can really see. That's not physically possible with a regular camera. So when I say that is, so I'm standing on the ground and you can have your camera and you can take a picture of something. And then if you have the drone flying, you can have it kind of the same level and take the exact same picture but there's no point of doing that because you're able to take the picture with your camera. So you want to try to bring the camera on the drone somewhere higher to a perspective that's not possible with your regular camera or using your hands, using your hands somewhere, having the camera and taking a shot. You want to try to go somewhere that's more unique to the environment you're in. Wait, where were so, the photos taken? The top right one is taken during the winter in Kamloops. And then the bottom right one was taken in uh, Mexico. This is off the coast of, uh, it was some, I forgot exactly where in Mexico, but this is like in the, um, in the ocean. I just like was flying it and then I found this kind of island looking thing. And then I took a picture of this and these are all edited in Lightroom also. And then this one was um, in Cuba. This one was a walkway with a little like gazebo and then this was kind of, I found this by mistake, just like you look at different perspectives and then I didn't expect it to look like this. But when you're looking at the screen while flying, I just, it looked really nice with the patterns. And this could be also the leading lines with the pathway. With the green pathway to the gazebo is kind of like leading lines a bit. And then the rocks around it. And then the bottom left one was taken at Seymour Valley. There's a walkway where the bike trail is next to the Seymour Dam. And then this was like a little pathway with a bridge. And then this red is coming off of the, like iron coming off of the rocks in the river. So that's why it gives it this red type of color. Um, so these ones, you could also do long exposures using a drone. It's much harder to do because your drone is kind of flying around in the air and it's hard to keep it stable, but they have a, kind of like a tripod mode. So you set it to tripod mode, the drone will fly and it'll keep, it'll try its best to stay in one spot without moving. And then it will take a long exposure, same thing as I explained before with the long shutter speed. You can have like a 20 second, 10 second picture. And then everything that we talked about with the other camera, with a regular camera would be the same thing as a drone. Okay, we have a few questions. Um, one person is asking how you can afford to travel so much and then someone else is asking about which drone you have and that these pictures are incredible. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't, well, mostly they're traveling with a family. It's not, uh, I'm not paying for everything, but it's like family vacations most of the time. Um, I have the DJI Mavic Pro is the first drone I have. And then the second drone I have is the Mavic Mini. It's the smaller type of drone that's made for more re recreational hobbyist use. But the problem with drones is there are a lot of laws you have to follow. You have to go to Transport Canada. You have to fill out a kind of a, um, you have to register your drone, like an application type of form. You have to register your drone with that. And then you get a serial number. You have to put that serial number on your drone if it's larger or heavier than 250 grams. And then once you're done that, you also have to take an online exam, kind of like getting your driver's license. So you basically have to study a PDF of all the rules on air safety regulations and everything on this. Uh, they provide you with all the material to study, basically like an exam. And then you do the online exam and then you get your pilot certificate. And then there's two types. There's like an advanced one and there's a basic one. 
the advanced one uh, is kind of is harder to get where you basically have to do an in-person examination with a, a physical person watching you, examining you like a driver's, basically exactly like a driver's license where you have an instructor who's assessing you and that you have to pay a fee to do both of those exams and registration. So the drone kind of, the drone community is having, having like problems with the laws because these regulations, sometimes you're allowed to fly in a certain area, but that's like the provincial law. So on the provincial law map, it says, oh, you're allowed to fly in this park. But then if you look um, to the bylaws, which is the city laws, they might have a different rule. They might say you're not allowed to fly RC vehicles or aircrafts in that park. So then you have to look at the provincial law and the bylaws, which is like the city laws. So then you have to look at the two things and then it gets a little bit confusing with that. And it gets annoying because sometimes you can't fly anywhere. Basically in Canada, it's almost impossible to fly. But if you have the right um, validation and everything, then you can fly there. In Mexico and other like foreign countries, you can fly as much as you want. There's no rules. But in Canada and the US, there's a whole bunch of Transport Canada and RSFA, or whatever it's called. They have to go through all that. OK, now I'm going to go through some my my personal type of tips I would give tips and tricks. So I want to try to use like a filter. There's also called there's also filters called um, polarizing filters, which basically reduces haze in your picture and it makes the sky look more blue. And it's the same thing as an ND filter. You just screw it on. And then basically that makes your image look, it's mostly used for landscapes, but it makes your image look much better. Um, handheld shots. Another thing I recommend is if you're not using a tripod is to try to shoot using burst mode because same thing as pressing the trigger on your, or the shutter on your camera, you're um, introducing kind of shaking to your camera. So you would want to, shoot in burst mode so once you have it held down you can take 10 or 5 pictures and the second the third or fourth picture would be more sharp because there's going to be less movement when you're pressing the shutter so the first picture is going to be more, a little bit more blurry it might be slight slight like uh difference but it's just a little bit of like a uh, nitpicky stuff that you can get into um another rule is to always shoot raw so I can explain more of that in the next workshop in Lightroom, but it gives you more dynamic range. You basically, when you look at your, um, uh, when you look at your chart, there's basically the histogram is a chart that shows you the midtones, highlights, and shadows in your image. And then you hit the perfect white and perfect black. And that's information that you cannot get back. So when you take a picture of something, and it's overexposed, blown out, and it's really white, then that means you hit absolute white. If you look at the histogram, you can't, um, if you're shooting in a JPEG, the histogram is very narrow and you don't have as much information, but if you're shooting in raw, you have a little bit more data and information to work with. So you might, when you take a picture, your camera shows you the histogram of your JPEG, not your raw image. And then when you take a picture, it shows you basically a distribution of what your image is. So if you hit absolute black or absolute white, you can't retain or get back any of that data when you're editing and post on Lightroom. And another thing I like to do is try different settings. You don't know which one might look better. You might try an ISO that might be higher or lower or a shutter speed that's higher or lower. One might look better than the other with how much light is going through your camera. There might be better image with if you have a take a darker image and you bring up the shadows and exposure artificially in Lightroom, that image might look better than a properly exposed image. Um, yeah, that's all I had for today. So is there any like other questions or something else that we can go through? Um, we're just talking about traveling in the chat. <laughs> Um, do you, I guess, do you have any like tips about travel photography? Like, I don't like carrying around a camera all the yeah. time. So. so basically cameras are, so do you, do you know the difference between DLSR and a mirrorless camera? 
One does not have a mirror. Um, yeah, yeah, that's basically it. But the De La Sar, basically, you have a, um, it's like the older traditional, they're still, they're still used now, but it was right, right when cameras came out, they used a mirror for flipping the image internally. You have a, like a mirror that flips, that's kind of using your viewfinder. So you'd see what you're looking at, it uses the mirror. So then the mirror flips up when you take a picture now and then the sensor is behind the mirror so if the the mirror was basically used so you can use a viewfinder so when you have the um the it's like kind of a 45 degree angle the mirrors in your camera and your viewfinder is up top and you're looking at the image like this it kind of bounces so when you have a picture here and then the image goes through the mirror and flips to your viewfinder that's how you can see the image in your viewfinder but now everything's more electronic where basically the you don't want to show your the the new cameras like Fuji XT1 and some other Sony um, A7 III and A7 II and they're all like mirrorless so they don't have a mirror anymore it's just a sensor inside the camera right here so whatever you're looking at it has a digital it makes like a digital file of what you're looking at like a viewfinder so it doesn't ever have a mirror anymore. So new cameras are the ones that are mirrorless. These ones are lighter. So for traveling, you usually want to just get like a mirrorless camera. They're getting better and better every year. But DLSR cameras, they're still Canon R5 came out. That one is not, um, that one uh, is not DLSR anymore. It's actually, it's a mirrorless camera. So all camera brands are moving towards mirrorless because it's a lighter, you can get the same power, but in a really small body and a really small camera. That is so interesting. Never so it's hard to like when you're traveling, basically what photographers try to do is you have all this stuff you need to carry. So it's really hard to kind of limit your kind of your backpack to limit this, the amount of weight you're carrying. So you need the camera, then you have to kind of plan ahead. So if you're going hiking or if you're going uh, somewhere in the forest, you want to get basically like a wide lens and a zoom lens. You don't really need to worry about grabbing a whole bunch of other lenses because it's extra weight. But when you're taking um, pictures of nature, you want to get like really wide pictures and really narrow, really like zoomed in pictures. And those are the two things that landscape photographers do is they just want to have wide pictures for the whole scene, you can see it, and very small, um, zoomed in like 600, 200 millimeter shots of mountains or something. And you don't, usually a tripod is also needed. So those are two things you need. But then you can also bring like the drone and the GoPro and all this other stuff, but it's a little bit, it gets a little bit like too much, too heavy if you're doing a hike or something. Yeah, but you can get those gains, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess another question I have is, like, what would be your biggest tip or word of advice for people who want to take great photos like you do? <laughs> like me? Uh, a lot of it comes with practice. Like, every single person that starts off, every single person you talk to that's more that knows what they're doing more in photography later on. They look at their past work, even like everyone, even I, when I look at my past work, it doesn't look as good. Like it looks like garbage when you look at it now because you learn so much more every single year and every single time you practice with uh, composition and finding different looks, you basically train your eye. So you see like photographs more kind of, I don't know, I want to say like more easily you see the, the shots you want to get in the composition. So it comes with practice, like anything comes with practice. So you have to just keep taking pictures and you would get better. Okay. Um, we have another question. What's your tip for phone photography? Uh, <laughs> phone photography? Are we talking about like, just like iPhone or are we talking about any phone? Is iPhone different from any phone? Portrait <laughs> mode? So. I know the problem with your iPhone is you don't, yeah, you don't have too much to do. Like you can't on, on um, 
Android, you can actually change the ISO and the shutter speed and stuff. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure what? you can. There's some phones you can change it and manual, but on the iPhone, it's all automated. Like you just take your phone out and then you take the picture and that's it. But on iPhone, you can tap on the screen. And so I don't know if, how many people are using iPhone, but if you tap on your screen and you have this yellow box that appears, and if you scroll up and down, you can change the exposure of how much light is going into your camera on your phone. Wait, what's a burst shot? A burst shot is, is a, it just takes like a whole bunch of pictures. And then you also have your timer. So you can actually do a lot of things with your phone. You can do all the time shots and sometimes people, the new iPhone has this, like the wide lens and this, like it has the three cameras in the corner. So you can do wide shots and then you can also do close up shots because it has three different focal lengths now. And then the iPhone 12 is coming out and I don't know what that camera is gonna be like Okay, so some more questions from the chat. Someone says that they have a normal digital camera and like, do you recommend getting a DSLR or a mirrorless for a beginner or intermediate level? Um, I think, so the mirrorless cameras, most of them, like all of them are really expensive. You're looking at around 600, 800 body only for a mirrorless, if you could get a used one, it might be better. I, I think that if you're beginning, it doesn't matter what camera you have. If you can get something like a DLSR camera, it would be good for a beginner intermediate. And once you understand all the settings on the camera and you know, and you're limited, you basically, so when you're starting off, if you have a T3i or something, um, Canon T3i and you used all the settings on the camera and you're kind of limited uh, the, the gear you're using is limiting you from being creative and getting images, then that's when you want to upgrade. When it starts limiting the, the quality of work you're doing. So I think if you can get your hands on, obviously, the, I think the mirrorless cameras are where everything's going right now. So if you can get a cheap, maybe used one on Craigslist, then or on Facebook, then I think you should get a mirrorless. But if not, then a DLSR is fine. They're still pretty good. Everyone uses them still. But then there's also things you have to look out for when you're buying it online because you don't know what's working or not. So you have to go through a checklist. There's online, you can look at used camera checklist and you try out every single setting of that camera, make sure everything's working before you buy it from the person. I just realized I have a food filter on my phone camera. <laughs> oh yeah. Amazing. That's the, you, you on your phone, it also tells oh, you, wait. it knows what you're taking, it, the AI in your phone basically knows what you're taking a picture of. So it knows if it's food or if it knows if it's like a nature shot, it kind of, the computer chip knows. I have white balance on my phone. And ISO. Whoa. Yeah, so you can change all that on Android. iPhone doesn't have any of that. I still want an iPhone though. But I can't mm, give up my yeah. Android back button. <laughs> um, okay, wait, we have another question. Um, can you go through the different lens that I that are good for different types of photography or like what are your go-to lens? For example, macro, telephoto, et cetera. So if you're doing, uh, so if you're trying to buy like a zoom lens, they're usually uh, expensive. Like fixed lenses are cheaper. So if you want to do macro photography, macro photography is basically you get really close to your subject. Like if you're taking a picture of a, a bumblebee on a like a leaf, you can get macro lenses, which are, you can get like 50 or I don't know what the, there's different macro lenses you can get and you get really close to the subject and then you can take a picture of that bee on a macro setting. But if you're trying to take a picture of something really far away, like a mountain, it usually makes them look bigger when you have a telephoto lens. So if you have a 600 or 400 millimeter zoom telephoto, 
and makes the subjects look bigger than where they are. It makes kind of, it compresses everything together. So if you have a subject standing here and then you have a, some trees here and you have a mountain, it's gonna kind of bring everything together to make it look more closer together. But if you have a wide angle, like a 10 millimeter or 20 millimeter, it's gonna kind of make everything really far away from each other. And it's gonna show you way more of the space, but it's gonna make everything look far away. So if you're taking pictures of mountains at a 20 to 14 millimeter time type of length or 12 millimeter, you can go really, you can go nine. There's a Lawa nine millimeter. That's this really wide one. That one could go and makes everything really um, small looking. So I think um, zoom lenses are probably like if you're beginning zoom, like buying a basic zoom lens would be, gives you the most range of what you want to do. Are zoom lens like where you can zoom in and zoom yeah. out? You can zoom in and zoom out. And then fixed lenses is you can't zoom in. You can only focus and change aperture. What do you think is a good range for the zoom lens? Like, I think I, it says 18 to 55 on mine. Yeah, that's, I think that's pretty good. 18 to 55 is usually like the standard, like a wide 18 and then a little bit closer 55, but then you can also go longer. Like uh, it's 18 to 135, but that one gets a little bit. The problem with zoom lenses is they have um, so many moving parts inside and so much like glass they kind of makes the it in like it brings in kind of uh problems with uh uh how do i explain it disformities kind of when you're taking a picture it has the images and everything is going to look good and it's not as fast though like if you're taking um a zoom lens and you're zooming it in and then you're zooming it out and your camera is having trouble kind of focusing it won't take pictures as fast when you're doing rapid fire mode, but if you have a fixed focal length, it takes it really fast because it's just that one one focal length. It doesn't have to the, the camera doesn't have to work as much. That makes sense. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Feel free to type them in the chat. Um, the workshop was supposed to, is supposed to end at eight p.m. and it is eight p.m. now, but. Um, keep going a little bit yeah it's a good vibe some people are saying thank you there were so many You're compliments welcome. about all your photos really? um, i couldn't i couldn't go through all of them because there was there's a lot but yeah they were amazing um okay i'm going to stop the recording now then if there's no more questions okay remember to turn down your volume because it'll say this recording has stopped really loudly wow. i've been warned